Hello Year 11. I know that some of you have still been unable to sit your mock exam for biology um, and I will be putting together, once everybody has done the mock examination, I will be putting together a PowerPoint going over each question and the mark scheme so that you can see where your strengths lie, what you got right and where your um, weaknesses, your areas for development are. Following on from the last unit that you've finished, B2.3 DNA and Inheritance, I've also put together some retrieval practice past paper questions so that you can cement your understanding of the last unit. Um, there will be new booklets being sent out to you, the B2.4, which is all about evolution and um, inheritance. Uh, and so those will be coming out to you hopefully by the end of this week. So this is for your lesson for this week. So you will need some paper um, and a pen or pencil to answer these questions. And these GCSE questions, you don't need to write out the actual question. You just write down your answers on the paper. Pause the video um, at the point where you're answering the question and then the answers will be given straight after. So in this question, it says genetic information is organized into structures of increasing complexity. Put the structures in the spaces in increasing order of complexity from the lowest to the highest. The most simple has already been given. So if bases are the lowest up here, then which of these words go in this order? Now, even though there are one, two, three, four, five lines there, and there are five words or five phrases to go into them, um, it's only worth three marks. And this is something that um, WJC does on occasion. So it's looking for full marks, um, for full answers for the full three marks. If you drop one of the um, answers, if you get it wrong, it'll be dropped down to two marks. And if you drop another one, it'll be dropped down to one mark and another mark will be dropped down even further. So have a go at doing that. Pause the video now. Second part of this question is to do with definitions and we've come across these definitions in this unit. We've got the, first of all the word allele, so you need to know what that means. And then we've got a definition of what is meant by a dominant allele as well as a recessive allele. And there would be one mark for each of these terms. Then it says what is meant by sexual reproduction. And again there are two marks here. So this whole question is a total of seven marks. So if I can ask you to pause the video and write down what you think, and then we'll go over the answers to this whole question. So for the first part of the question, as you can see here in the pink, it gives us some advice. So if you get all three correct, um, uh, sorry, if you get all five correct, there would be three marks. If you're only getting three correct, you would be dropped down to two marks. And if you're only getting one or two correct, one mark. So the bases, of which there are four different types, remember adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine, shown as A, T, C and G, often in diagrams. There are four of them. The triplet code would be three of these bases joining together. Um, the triplet codes would then join together to make a small section of DNA called a gene. The DNA itself then is all of these genes together. The DNA then curls itself up into the shapes of chromosomes and the chromosomes would be found inside the nucleus of the gamete cells like a sperm or an egg. For the second part, our definitions. The pink boxes give us some advice, so these are really useful when you're coming to revise for this topic. A dominant allele is expressed or shows its characteristics when only one copy is present. So in other words, if I use the letter A, the dominant is always shown as a capital and the recessive is shown as a lowercase. So if this is saying a dominant allele is expressed when only one is present, we can have what we call heterozygous dominant, or we can have homozygous dominant. But you only actually need one copy because this dominant allele always overpowers and masks the effect of the recessive allele. The recessive allele then, its definition, will be expressed only when there are two copies present, okay? Or when 
only when the dominant gene is not present. So, for example, using our letter A, we would have to have two copies of the recessive allele to show us um, that particular characteristic. They advise you to avoid words like stronger or weaker when defining these two words. So dominant overpowers, masks the effect of the recessive um, and shows only when one is present, one copy. Whereas the recessive allele, okay, you have to have two copies present. Finally, what is meant by sexual reproduction, okay? They are very, very keen on you using either this word, the fusion, or the joining or fertilization of male and female gametes. Here you could say sperm and egg. It's really important that you get this kind of key part, this idea of joining, fusing, fertilizing, and not just meeting, okay? The sperm does not swim up to the egg and just meet it it joins with it, it fertilizes it. So that's out of a total of seven marks. Write down how many you had and keep a record of these questions. So our next question, we've got some data analysis here. A bit of a longer question, a bit more to read. So a scientist was doing an investigation into leaf widths for two species of plants. One grows in shady areas, the others in unshaded. The width of the leaf was measured as shown in diagram one and seven leaves in total were measured on each plant. The results are recorded in the table. So the first question says calculate the range of leaf widths for the plants in the unshaded area. So this is our unshaded area. We've got our data here and you need to know what the definition of range is. So that's cross curricular. You come across that in maths as well as in um, science and it's worth two marks and it also says show your working so make sure you do that second part of the question suggest a benefit for a larger mean width of leaves in the shaded area so why might it be an advantage for a leaf to have a bigger surface area and um, particularly if it's growing in a shaded area two marks Table below shows some of the known observed characteristics for the two plants and you've got to decide whether these features are caused by inherited, environmental or a combination of both inherited and environmental. So pause the video, answer those questions for me and we will be going over the answers at the end of this. The last part of this question, it says, place a tick in the column to identify whether the characteristic is inherited. So that's from the previous page. How are characteristics inherited by the plant? Notice there are two marks here. So it's wanting two bits of information to say how features or characteristics are inherited. And there's a total of 10 marks. Pause the video, go back if you need to, to answer on paper, and then these are the answers. So first of all, for the range of leaf widths, our smallest leaf is here in the unshaded 2.7 and our largest leaf is 3.6. So to work out the range, we minus 2.7 from 3.6, which gives us a value of 0.9. If you had 0.9 in here, you would instantly get two marks. If you had the wrong answer here, but you'd shown the correct working and you just made a mistake, you hadn't double checked, you would still be able to pick up one mark. So it's really important to show your workings. Suggesting a benefit for a larger mean width of leaves, the wider leaves can catch, absorb, collect more light, okay? That would get you one mark, this idea of getting more light, and the second mark for this process of photosynthesis. In terms of which of these features are inherited, environmental or both, height is caused by a mixture. 28 chromosomes in cells would be only inherited and 14 in egg cells would be only inherited. Fungus spots on some of the leaves would be caused by the plant being infected by fungi and so that would be environmental. And the last part to this question, how are characteristics inherited by the plant? So this is key. 
that they're passed on from the parent plants through gametes or again you can say pollen or egg remember this is plants so please don't remember sperm and egg okay um, some plants can reproduce asexually so it would be acceptable to say by asexual reproduction for the second mark here okay so it's a total of 10 marks write down how many you scored this question is about a condition called polydactyly. If you look at the diagram here, you should notice that there's something a little bit unusual in that this person, instead of having our five fingers, has got an additional finger here. This condition is called polydactyly. That word poly means many and dactyl, dactyl means digit, so it can be a finger or a toe. We call this diagram here, okay, a family tree diagram. And the key at the side gives us a little bit of information to help us read it and understand it. An affected male is always a square and it's coloured in black in this particular key, whereas an unaffected male would be white. An affected female is shown a circle and is coloured in black, whereas an unaffected female is a circle and white. It tells us the letters that they want to use. Sometimes in these questions they will ask you to choose the letters, but in this particular case they're um, giving you the letter D. They're telling you that polydactyly is caused by a dominant allele. So we know that that must have to have a capital D. And the recessive allele of the gene is represented by a lowercase d. They want you to use one genetic diagram to show the inheritance of the polydactyly gene by R and S. So in terms of these two people here, there are four children, one, two, three, four, two boys, two girls. The One of the boys and one of the girls has been affected by polydactyly and one of the boys and one of the girls hasn't. And the parents, one, the male, the father had polydactyly, the mother didn't, okay? So have a go at doing that question using those. Remember, we use that Punnett square. So you would put your male alleles here and your female alleles here and then you would fill in your Punnett square with the letters. Have a go, pause the video and then we'll go over the answers. So as we can see here, we've got our little Punnett square. I'm going to start down here first of all. And we're looking at this is the male and the reason we can tell this is the male, capital D, little d, is because the male has polydactyly. The reason we know that the male must be um, what we call heterozygous, a one copy of each type of the allele, is that if they were homozygous, then all the offspring, all of the children would have polydactyly. So we have 50-50 chance here of them having polydactyly or not. Q has to be homozygous recessive. In other words, has two copies of the recessive allele, because if they had a copy of the dominant allele, they would have polydactyly, they would have the additional finger. So the genotype from the father is capital D and little d. That would get you one mark. The genotype from the mother, from Q, that would be homozygous recessive, okay, two little d's. And the offspring's genotypes, okay, would be correctly shown in our Punnett square. So if this is our male and this is our female, so you could put male P, and I would advise you putting this into your Punnett square, male P, female Q, so that you're clear on what you're crossing. We've got the male sperm and the female egg would be heterozygous, and this person would have polydactyly. So this would be um, our person R. And another one, male and female, this could be our person, um, eh, uh, well, our female, okay, next to R. And then this one, the male sperm and the female egg, both of these homozygous recessive, so this could be either person S or the person next to them, their sister, that also doesn't suffer from polydactyly. The other way to show this diagram is to do it this way. It is rather messy though, so the father's sperm would have capital D and a lowercase d and the mother's eggs would both have recessive copies and then when these join together, the sperm and the egg, 
and where are we that one and that one and then that one and that one and that one and that one we can see we have two who are affected by polydactyly and two who are unaffected again okay? the punnett square is always the the better way it says an alternative way to show the answer it just allows you to show very very clearly what's happening in inheritance Okay, this next question is about genetic profiling. Okay, so have a look at the question. Chromosome contains molecules of DNA. Genes are small sections. Each gene contains a code. What does a cell use this code for? And then we've got the DNA fingerprints of man A and B and the child and the mother. And it wants to know which man is more likely to be the father of the child. So pause the video. Write down your answers and we'll go over these after we've done the second part. Second part of the question then, not only which man is more likely to be the father of the child as we've answered already on the previous slide, use the numbers, these numbers describing the bands, to explain your choice. Now there are three marks here. So in your answer, it tells you you should refer to all four people. That's really important. Pause the video, have a go at answering the question. Only half of the bars of the child's DNA fingerprint will match the mother's DNA fingerprint. Explain why. And this is worth two marks. So we're looking for two reasons why only half of the child's match the mother's DNA fingerprint. And it's out of a total of seven. So, pause the video, answers will follow. So, in terms of the first part of the question, there are two marks here and it says, what does a cell use this DNA code for? It's to combine or use amino acids for one mark in a particular order to manufacture proteins. So, there are three kind of parts to this, but we're only expecting you to get two of them. Remember, the way DNA gives you characteristics is by making proteins. So you would not have got a mark here if you don't say anything to do with controlling your features. For the second part, the man that's more likely to be the father of the child is man B. And the reason why, why the child here gets their bars or lines from both their mother and their father, or you could say parents. That would get you one mark. So the child has the mother's bars from 25, 28, 30, and 31. So we can see where they line up. And it also gets the bars from man B, um, 10, 12, 13, and 14. Lots of people forget to revise the DNA fingerprinting section and examiners have noticed this. So make sure you know this just in case it comes up. For the explanation of why only half of the child's DNA fingerprint matches the mother, it's to do with the gametes. So the gametes, or you can describe them as eggs or sperm, contain only half of the mother's DNA. Remember, there's only 23 chromosomes in the human sperm, 23 in the egg. So when they join together at fertilization, they make 46. And the reason why there's only half numbers is due to meiosis. Remember, this is the type of cell division that creates the gametes or the sex cells. So mark your score out of seven. Next question. This is all about inheritance of sex. So the chromosomes for determining the gender or sex of a person are labeled X and Y. You've got four marks here and lots of space to use a diagram. So preferably a, a Punnett square type diagram, the grid, the table, to show how the gender of a child, in other words, the sex of the child, is determined by the chromosomes inherited from the parents. Pause the question and have a go at answering this. So, second part, what are the chances of getting a baby boy? You can either show this as a percentage, as a fraction, or as a ratio. Some questions they will um, ask you to give a percentage, a fraction, or a ratio, but where they say what are the chances, you can give it in any format. 
A couple have three boys. What are the chances of the next child being a boy? Circle the correct response. So pause the video, answer the questions, and the answers will follow. So in our Punnett square, if I draw it at the side here, you can show the father is XY and the mother is XX. So one mark for the father, one mark for the mother. And then the combinations, when we fill in the sperm and the egg joining together here, and the sperm and the egg joining together here, we can see clearly that we've got two out of the four are female, two out of the four are male. So genders are written XY as boys and XX as girls or female. So there's four marks and you can see where the four marks come from. The chances of getting a baby boy then are one in two or two in four as our fractions. 0 0.5, okay, or 50% or 50 to 50, 1 to 1, or an even or equal chance. So all of those answers are correct because they are not specifying percentage chance or ratio or fraction. The interesting thing is that every time a couple go to have another child, the chances don't change just because you've already had, say, three boys like this couple. The chances of the next child being a boy will also be exactly the same, 50-50 chance. So give yourself a mark out of six there. This question is a higher tier question. So if you are doing foundation, you can skip this question. It's concerning a molecule of DNA containing four different bases. We know that the four different bases are called adenine, A, thymine, T, cytosine, G, uh, C, and guanine, G. For foundation, you only need to know the letters. For higher tier, you need to know their names. The four bases are arranged in a long chain, and the chain of bases controls the synthesis of a protein. So the chain of bases could make a protein that determines somebody's eye color. The diagram shows some bases along with a strand a along a strand of DNA. The word described to use to describe a small section of a DNA molecule that controls the synthesis of a protein. I'll give you a clue, okay? We'll separate them up. In a cell, where are the proteins synthesized? So think about what you learnt in um, the very first unit. And then for the last part of the question, describe how proteins are this synthesized. This is three marks. This is probably one of the hardest questions on a GCSE paper. If it's three marks, it wants three things. So think about what you've seen in the diagram and use it to help you answer this question. For the last part, mistakes sometimes occur when DNA molecules are copied during cell division. Suppose that one of the W bases shown in the diagram, so if I go back, where are they? was substituted by an X base. What might be the effect of this change in the structure of a protein? Okay, so pause the, the video, answer the question. So the first bit here, a small section of a DNA molecule that controls the synthesis of a protein is gene or allele. This word allele is different versions of the gene, so dominant or recessive. In the cell where proteins synthesize ribosomes, okay, you should have learned that from um, year 10. And then this one, the tricky one. We know that amino acids make up a protein. That will get you one mark. A protein is a particular combination or sequence of amino acids that would get you a mark. And that these bases form a code. Now the most common things that people describe are that the bases work in threes or triplets. Yeah? And that these triplet codes code for one amino acid. So we're more likely to see you give answers in terms of the three marks in that three bases make a triplet, the triplets make an amino acid, and the amino acids make a protein. So I personally, that is the most common format of uh, sequencing of answering that question, those three that I've highlighted. 
Mistakes sometimes occur when DNA molecules are copied. So what might be the effect of this change? That the protein would be made incorrectly or would not function. So in this case, you'd be given a change in eye colour because it's mentioned in the question. Okay. Give your mark out of six. This question is about definitions, okay? Just like we had the dominant and the recessive, it's really important that you understand what these prefixes homo and hetero mean and this word here, genotype. So genotype is the combination of genes or alleles for a particular feature or characteristic. The prefix homo, think about what you've learnt, um, what that means and what hetero means. Write down your definitions and we'll go over these answers at the end of this question. Second part to this question, we have another family tree. And this is about a family tree of a family with an inherited disorder, um, a particular genetic one. It doesn't tell us what the disorder is, um, but we've got to try and figure out is this um, disorder controlled by a dominant or a recessive allele. So again, dark black square is an affected male, dark black circle is an affected female, and white squares are um, healthy males and healthy females. So we've got both of the parents were actually affected by whatever this inherited disorder was. And of the two parents, they had one child who had the disorder and one child who didn't. These are the people they married. So this person here is number three's wife, and then they go on and have one, two, three children. This couple haven't had any children either yet or not at all. Um, and this couple have had two children. Going on this side, we've got this child from one and two married, had three children. Of the three children, all three had the condition. They married, both of them, and one had one child with the condition and one had the child without the condition. So we know that this disorder must be caused by what type of allele? Answer the question and we'll go over it. And then this is the part that everybody finds hard to answer. It's worth three marks. You can use a genetic diagram. So again, the Punnett square, the grid to help you explain the reasons for your answers. Pause the video and we'll go over those. Final part to the question. Person 4 may have a different genotype to person 6. So if we go back to our family tree, there's person 4 and person 6. They both are affected males, but their genotype, their combination of letters may be different. And they don't give you the letters in this particular question, so you can use any letter you like. Remember to use a letter that looks different written as a lower and a capital case. So first up, Homozygous genotype. Two alleles for a gene are both the same, okay? They can either be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So if I use the letter A, homozygous dominant would be two um, dominant alleles, homozygous recessive, two recessive alleles. A heterozygous genotype is two alleles that are different. So there can only be one combination of this, one capital, one lowercase, one dominant and one recessive. So check your answers and mark them. Then for the disorder, we know that it's caused by a dominant allele. You tend to see a more affected um, individuals in a family tree if it is dominant, okay? Um, that's not always the case, but in this particular case it is. So Explain the reasons for your answers. You could use a genetic diagram to help you. Person one and two have a child with the disease and a child without. So that would be your first mark. So both of the individuals, one and two, must be heterozygous. So if we say that they are both heterozygous, when we draw our Punnett square, we have three quarters chance of the children having the condition. So these would all be affected. And one quarter chance of them not being affected. If it was recessive, then all the children would have the disease. So they must be heterozygous and have one dominant, one recessive allele. 
However, to be affected then, you could either be affected and be homozygous affected, have two copies, or you could be heterozygous affected. So this helps you to answer question 3C. Person 4 and person 6 both have the disease. So why may they be different? Person 4 may have two dominant alleles or a dominant and recessive allele because both parents had one dominant allele, i.e. they had the disease. And one recessive allele because they passed this to person 3 who does not have the disease. So person 3 obviously is too recessive. Person 6 must have one dominant and one recessive allele as they have one child with the disease and one child without. Okay, so this is quite an involved question. It's worth having a go. You'll be allowed some flexibility. There are several different marks that you could pick up. You only need a maximum of three. And you would be quite um, able to use the letters as well to explain the genotypes. Um, but I would try to use these words about being dominant and recessive. Okay. Okay, a question on Mendel then. Gregor Mendel, we know, was a monk who studied inheritance in thousands of pea plants. Pea plants can either produce yellow or green pea seeds. He crossed plants that produced yellow pea seeds with plants that always produce green pea seeds. And he found that all the seeds produced from the cross were yellow. Use the symbol D to represent the dominant allele and D, little d, to represent the recessive. So if he's crossing yellow and green, and we always get yellow, we know that the yellow must be the dominant, capital D, and the green pea seeds must be recessive. So which alleles did the seeds from the cross have? And then for this section, the harder part, again, three marks, Mendel grew hundreds of plants. He had 5,496 yellows and 1,832 green pea seeds explain why his crosses gave him these results, use a genetic diagram so they definitely want to pun it square this time, and use the symbols capital D and lowercase. Pause the video, have a go at writing your answers down, and we'll go over those. Second part to the question then, one of Mendel's crosses produces 18 yellow peas and 15 green. These numbers do not match the expected ratio of yellow and green seeds. Suggest why. And the importance of Mendel's discovery was not recognised until many years after his death. Give one reason why. So this is out of five marks. Pause the video, attempt the questions, and I will go over the answers. So first of all, the alleles from the seeds from the cross had were heterozygous, capital D, little d, one mark for that. And then in our Punnett square then, it says, explain why Mendel's cross gave him these results, okay? So if he had purebred yellow and purebred green, okay, he would have all of the offspring having yellow flowers to begin with. Then if he took two of these heterozygous crosses, so I'm just going to rub this out a second, and he did what we call the F2 generation, where he did a back cross. So this is just this, but explained in a Punnett square. We should get our typical 3 to 1 ratio, where we've got 3 out of the 4 would be yellow, and one out of the four would be green. So we call that your typical three to one ratio. So make sure that you've got the gametes, capital D, little d, capital D, little d, so here and here. Correctly done the offspring from the cross, so correctly filled in this bit for the second mark. An identification of yellow and green, it's fine to circle them like this. So you should indicate the phenotype is the description of the color. For the second part, why did he not get this 3 to 1 ratio that he expected here? That chance or expected ratio is only probability. You could also say that he had quite a small sample size here, um, but it's not just an error and they certainly are not looking for anomalous results. 
for 1B Part 2, the importance of Mendel's discovery wasn't recognised until many years after his death. Um, the reason why was genes, chromosomes, or alleles, or DNA had not been discovered. The microscope hadn't even been um, uh, invented at this point to be able to see inside the cell and see things like chromosomes and genes. Or that it was published in an obscure journal and few scientists read his work. This one we're less likely to see. You may have got this one. This particular work, Mendel, is not about challenging evolution. So. Um, this was what Darwin then had to deal with, which we're going to come across in our next um, unit. Next question. This is a QWC question. So this is an ex uh, opportunity for extended writing, and it's about stem cells. I'm going to give you some time to read through the information in the text above there. And then this is an evaluative question. Okay, In evaluate, remember, we need some pros some good things, advantages, and we need some cons. And ideally, we want to get a, a good balance of these pros and cons. But to sum up our evaluation, as you do in English, you would give a conclusion, what your viewpoints are. Do you agree with using stem cells from embryos or from adult bone marrow? So give yourself quite a bit of time to have a go at answering this question. Draft yourself up a kind of typical response or the types of points that you would put in. And then don't forget to use capital letters and full stops and correct spelling, punctuation and grammar in your answer to this. Pause the video and then I will go over the kind of responses that we would expect to be seeing in this answer. So remember, evaluation is about looking for pros and cons. So the advice is in this pink box. You can't just copy out the relevant bits from the given information as pros and cons. You have to expand on them. Some of the older mark schemes would allow for that, but they're now looking for a good evaluation that actually expands on what you've read. Other points that might gain a mark are that the long-term effects are also not known. So. For some pros, some advantages, that these embryonic stem cells can treat a wide variety, lots of diseases or problems. So you might be able to name some of those like Alzheimer's, repairing of the spine for people who've suffered paralysis, um, uh, treating diabetes. That there are many um, embryo, embryonic stem cells available, there are plenty, and using them is better than wasting them, and it's painless. However, the cons, and these are the ones that come up on a regular basis, that it's possible harm or death to the, the embryo, and that these embryos can't be asked. This idea of embryos rights, okay? You can't just write that it's not moral or ethical, okay? You've got to give examples of why it's not moral or ethical. The cons are also that it's untested, unreliable, it may not always work. So for adult bone marrow stem cells, what are the advantages of these? There are no ethical issues in collection or permission given um, because the adult has consented. There's quick recovery from the treatment and it's relatively safe, well tried and tested and they know that they work. But the cons are that these adult bone marrow stem cells do not differentiate or specialise into the variety of different cells that our embryonic stem cells do. Okay, so have a look at your answer. Give yourself a mark. It's always out of six. Remember, to get full marks for five and six, you need to have completely correct spelling, punctuation and grammar. If you have a few mistakes, it might drop you down to a three or four mark. And if your text is um, got no spelling, punctuation and grammar through it, um, then it would be dropped down to one or two, even if you'd picked up some of these points, but you'd spelt, misspelt them or you hadn't used a capital letter and a full stop in your sentence. This question here is about root cells undergoing cell division. The cells are at various different stages of dividing, as we can see in these diagrams. So it wants you to name the type of cell division, what happens to the genetic material before it divides, and why is this type of cell division important for an organism. Pause the video and write down your answers. 
So this second part of the diagram shows the types of cell divisions happening during human reproduction in a male and a female. We've got cell A, B, C and D and then what happens here. So it wants to know the type of cell division that makes the cell D from B. Then it also wants to know why is this type of cell division important in producing cell C or D. So cell C or D here. And meiosis and mitosis are the names of the two different types of cell division in human cells. Compare the two processes by referring to where each takes place and the kind of products are made. This is worth five marks. This is bordering on a QWC um, type response here. So give yourself a moment, go back if you need to, to these questions, pause the video, answer the questions, and I will go over the answers next. So the type of cell division is mitosis, that would be one mark, because it's happening in cells undergrowing, in root cells undergrowing cell division. What happens to the genetic material before the cell divides? It doubles or replicates or copies itself. Why is this type of cell division important for organisms? Because it's for growth or repair are the two most common answers we get, but you can also say for asexual reproduction. Make sure you don't say repair cells. Mitosis is for repairing tissues, not cells. Name the type of cell division that produces cell D from B. It is meiosis because if you notice, these are sperm and these are eggs. Okay. Why is this type of cell division important in making cells C or D? because it reduces or halves the number of chromosomes. Sometimes it's actually referred to as reduction division meiosis, because it reduces the number of chromosomes. And it ensures that the embryo offspring have the correct or double set when the sperm and the egg rejoin. So 23 and 23, when they join together, is going to make your full set of 46. In terms of the comparison um, section of the question, um, compare the two processes by referring to where each takes place and the kind of products that are made. So this is useful to get under your belt. It could be a six marker question, as we've said. So the kinds of things we're looking for. I'll start with mitosis first. This is the type of cell division for growth and repair. It's asexual. Um, it happens in all cells in the body, apart from the sex um, organs. You have the same number of chromosomes, that these chromosome numbers are diploid, or if it's in humans, there would be 46. There's no variation, or they are identical. I personally, I would put that they are genetically identical. That there are always two cells produced, and you could say you could call them daughter cells, that's what scientists call them. <coughs> and there's only one division. Apologies. Meiosis, on the other hand, then, um, is to create the sex cells or gametes. It happens in the sex organs, so you can describe these as the ovaries or the testes. Um, it halves the number of chromosomes, as we've described up here, to create haploid cells. Variation is possible. Um, but they are not identical, these cells, because of what we call crossing over. So you might remember seeing that in the animations on meiosis. There are four daughter cells produced, and this is because the cells divide two times, two divisions, okay? And that is the end of our practice questions. So hopefully that's helped cement some understanding. Even if you've struggled with some of those questions, please, please, please have a look at the um, mark schemes and the answers because they will help you. And we look forward to you returning to school soon.